Hi everyone. Today we're going to be talking about generating more pipeline with B2B personalization and how you can bend the curve. So I'm going to start with a pretty common example. This is Huli. They're trying to sell their enterprise solution, uh, next generation hybrid cloud in in innovation. Uh, they've got a landing page and a call to action to schedule a demo. And obviously behind that call to action, uh, there's a form. And that form leads to Nina, our uh, enterprise account executive at Huli. Now, Nina is a model uh, salesperson, the one that we wish we all had more of in our team. She's got a strong business perspective, so she understands uh, her target accounts, uh, who Huli sells to, historical sales numbers, you know, all of that. She also has a strong customer perspective. She knows that customers have to go through certain steps to make an informed decision, and uh, she understands that she has to guide customers through those steps. And finally, Nina has, uh, like any good salesperson, a strong sales perspective. Uh, she's trying to maximize the likelihood of generating revenue and hitting her quarterly numbers. So let's look at the few of the prospects that fill out that form and actually get on Nina's calendar. So the first one is uh, from a tier one account. He's a CTO, a decision maker. Uh, him and his team have really done, done their homework. Uh, they've, they've evaluated Huli, they've evaluated competitors. You know, a perfect example of a highly motiva motivated buyer. Uh, one that we all had, we wish we had more of in our pipeline. So after a brief conversation, Nina he realizes that, uh, that this prospect's ready to go and suggests next steps. You know, let me get a contract in front of you. Let's start the commercial conversation. Next prospect is from a tier two account, so still qualifies for enterprise, but but is more of an end user. So you know, after talking to her, Nina realizes that she's going to love the product when she gets her hands on it. Um, she may not be the one making the decision, but uh, she will see the value of it of Huli Enterprise, and she's going to be a strong advocate internally in the organization. So Nina decides that next steps are: let me set you up with an enterprise trial. Uh, get work, get going on Huli Enterprise, and I'll check back in in 30 or 60 days, uh, and, and we'll have a conversation about how uh, we can expand the dialogue uh, internally at the company. Finally, the third prospect that comes in is a mid-market account, so kind of on the bubble in terms of an account, um, but he is a decision maker. Now, uh, he's a little bit more unfamiliar with, with Huli Enterprise, the solution and the value that it's going to bring to his company. He's doing his research right now, um, so he's not, not terribly well informed. So after a conversation, Nina says, well, the logical next step here is, you know, let me send you material. Let's, let's start this conversation going. You're not really ready to buy yet. You know, you've got to go through certain steps, and, and, and we're going to educate you on the value that Huli Enterprise can bring. So uh, here, Nina is making all the right decisions based on the, all of the perspective that she has uh, and putting forth in front of each of these prospects the logical uh, next steps for them. Now, of course, what happens here is as the number of uh, prospects through that pipeline and, and through that form increases, uh, Nina starts getting bogged down. Uh, we all wish that we were getting more of those highly motivated tier one buyers, but in reality, you know, our sales team starts speaking to more and more of the uh, the tire kickers, the people who aren't ready yet, and uh, spending a disproportionate amount of time on them. So that leads to inevitable scaling challenges. So what does Huli do? Well, uh, the marketing team steps in. And the marketing team says, well, we can take some of those experiences and next steps that, that Nina is, is putting in front of customers and actually uh, push those into our website and our website experience. So the first uh, variation and experience that they come up with is, is a very commercially oriented one uh, about plans and pricing and a talk to sales call to action. The second one is uh, you know about that free trial. Try out the next generation uh, free trial. Take it for a spin. Uh, you can do it online without talking to a salesperson. The third experience that they come up with is you know more of a content nurture. Uh, customers who aren't ready to to buy yet, download a white paper. We'll put you on a digital nurture, uh, and, and you know over time we think you'll be like you'll be more ready to buy. So, uh, what do they do? Well, as data driven marketers, they decide to uh, run some A/B tests and, and test how those work. Uh, now, this is an, an actual example from a, from a real customer, but I've left out some of the names to protect the innocent. So the first, when they, when they test the, the first variation, it actually uh, decreases the number of conversions through, coming through that call to action and form. Uh, not many people want to talk to sales. But it turns out that uh, of the ones that do fill out the form and become leads, they actually convert uh, in a greater number and a higher number into, into opportunities. You know, those that do... Uh, those that are willing to talk to sales uh, are more willing to actually uh, to actually buy. 
Now, in the in the in the second variation, uh, the A/B testing results are completely the opposite. So more people start that free trial uh, because they don't have to talk to sales, but less of those turn into opportunities. And you get a lot of drop offs in that free trial uh, because you know they're they're just not ready. And the third one, the content nurture, you know, it's really hard uh, for the Huli marketing team to draw any conclusive results there. Um, it's, it's just not a, content nurture is, is a long process. It's not well suited to traditional A-B testing. So, uh, I've got mixed results, and inevitably the marketing team asks, where do we go from here? How do we make a decision on what experience is best? Well, we're not actually going to answer that right now. We're going to take a step back and first acknowledge that uh, as B2B marketers, you know, we have a problem. We say in survey after survey, and this is an example of it, that you know our top priorities uh, are, are around growing traffic to our website uh, and converting uh, that traffic into leads and customers. Again, you know, in, in looking at, at channels and which ones are most important to us uh, as marketers, you know, our website in survey after survey is either number one, number one, or number two in terms of the the role that it plays. All roads lead to the website. So, what do we do about this? Well. We end up pushing out a lot more content, uh, whether you look at you know the, the growth in, in content marketing uh, or the surveys year after year, B2B marketers say they're going to push out you know more content than the year before. It also turns out that we redesign our websites. So the top reason here uh, that, that many of you are redesigning your websites is to optimize for lead generation or sales. Now, it also turns out that we do this often. Uh, the vast majority of you have redesigned your website in, in the last 12 months. Now, interestingly, uh, all of this uh, website redesign doesn't actually lead to satisfaction. Uh, in this survey, the cohort of uh, respondents that were uh, most unhappy with their website redesign were also most likely to have done it in the last three months. And this is my uh, favorite number here. 63% of you have no idea how much that last website redesign costs. And that's probably a conservative number because it's assuming that the other 37% were actually telling the truth. So what does this, uh, all of this redesign and content actually do for our visitors? Well, we end up showing them all of the calls to action on our site and making them decide, choose your own adventure. We show all of our products and make them pick one. We show all of the case studies and everything in the resource library and make them do their own homework. We show them all of the industries that we possibly serve. And of course we show them every single pricing option that we have available. In this case I don't know what happens if I pick enterprise uh, and I'm also elite. So this has the effect of introducing cognitive load onto our customers and visitors. So this was a cognitive load theory, something that was studied by uh, John Sweller, uh, from a professor from Australia, and initially published this in the 1950s. Basically, uh, Sweller says that increasing what he calls extraneous cognitive load uh, reduces and has an objective uh, impact on uh, someone's ability to absorb that information to their working memory, to learn that information, and to make a decision. And that's obviously the opposite of what we want uh, customers that we're trying to sell to on our website to do. So, it turns out that you know what, what we know about buyers also reflects this. Uh, we know that buyers are, are even for offline B2B purchases, uh, they're all doing their research online. And, you know, it, and it turns out that the most important factor in the design of a website is not you know, the cutting, cutting edge uh, technology or the, the beautiful aesthetics, it's you know, the website making it easier for the buyer to find what they want. So, what if we only showed the most relevant and effective calls to action on our website? What if we only showed the logos and testimonials that were relevant to a particular visitor? What if we only showed pricing plans and benefits that were meaningful to a particular buyer? Fundamentally, what if we showed a more relevant customer experience based on what we knew about that particular visitor and were able to do that through our website? Well, it turns out that doing this has real and meaningful implications. Buyers uh, overwhelmingly say they choose us because, uh, and, and any winning vendor because they demonstrated a stronger knowledge of our needs. 
buyers are already starting to expect improved uh, personalized uh, product and service recommendations. And I think the scariest uh, point here is that last, that third bullet, uh, a majority of business buyers uh, from the Salesforce research study were likely to switch and change brands if the company didn't make an effort to personalize communications. So with the importance of the website, with the importance of uh, getting the right information to the buyer, you know, should we assume that, you know, personalization in B2B is, is working out and everyone's doing it? Well, it turns out the data uh, suggests the opposite. Uh, Sixty-seven percent, two-thirds of us, are not using any form of website personalization. And those of us that are, um, are significantly less satisfied with our website personalization efforts compared to our B2C marketing counterparts. So that, that data leads to quotes like this. Um, now, this is, this is pretty rough. Joel Harrison suggests that B2B marketers are still struggling, struggling with basic marketing data uh, and can't even handle the challenges and obstacles in big data. So I'm here to say that fundamentally, this is not your fault. It's not your fault. Website personalization can be really hard. Uh, at Funnel Envy, we see these uh, objections and constraints all the time. Uh, reasons for not personalizing, don't have technology, don't have the, the bandwidth or the team, don't have the necessary data. And data is one that we're particularly focused on at Funnel Envy, uh, whether that's you know having enough data, data quality, the resources to manage it, or just getting the insights from the data that you do have. Fundamentally, I think this, uh, this reflects a broader problem, and, and that's that personalization and the existing personalization tools and processes have not adapted to B2B. And for those technologies and processes to be effective in a B2B environment, they have to actually conform to the way uh, our sales and marketing funnels work to deliver more value with less effort. So to, to understand that, let's start with a definition. Optimize is a definition of website personalization on their side. It's a, it's, it's a good one. Uh, they say that website personalization is the process of creating customized experiences for visitors to a website. And rather than providing a single broad experience, personalization allows companies to present visitors with unique experiences tailored to their needs and desires. I'm going to suggest an evolved definition for B2B personalization. It starts out very much the same, the process of creating unique experiences for website visitors, uh, but the purpose is to increase engagement values that maximize marketing influence revenue. So two important components there. One is the purpose, it's about engagement value, and the second one is the outcome. Uh, this is a measurable outcome for your personalization, which is increasing marketing influence revenue, and that's how we're going to measure it. Now, another important point in understanding why B2B website personalization has to be different than uh, business consumers to understand the market characteristics. We're not selling shoes. If we were selling shoes or a traditional e-commerce site, uh, we would know that the vast majority of visitors coming to our site, if you're Amazon or Zappos or uh, Netflix, uh, are potential customers. That could be 90, 95 plus percent of visitors to the site uh, are someone that you could be selling to. Uh, B2B markets are fundamentally different. B2B markets, especially as you skew the enterprise uh, and business to enterprise, uh, approximate what's known as a Pareto distribution, which is a power law distribution. Now, what that means is that a much smaller slice of the total addressable market and visitors on your site represent significantly more uh, economic contribution to your company. So that means that if you were a, if you were a business to consumer or an e-commerce site, uh, like a Netflix or an Amazon, you can assume an average customer, uh, which would be the, the meaty part of the curve, the large part of the curve, generate a lift and recoup significant economics from it. But in B2B, that's not going to work. Uh, it turns out there is no such thing as an average customer. In fact, the more skewed your market is at the top end uh, and, and, and the fewer number of high value accounts you have, uh, the less effective optimizing for an average visitor is going to be. Now, if you're doing account-based marketing, you already know this. This is the theory that underpins account-based marketing. Uh, the idea of tiering your accounts based not on the, the aggregate number of them, but on the value of those accounts. Uh, and so the strategic accounts at the top, uh, although they may be few in number, represent the larger economics to your business. And so you're going to effectively personalize and orchestrate your sales and marketing process to deeply penetrate those accounts. And for that reason, you know, we, we like to say that account-based marketing is personalization. It may not be exclusively website personalization, but it is a personalized sales and marketing approach based on account value and not the number of accounts. 
So if we think about what that means for uh, website personalization in B2B, what we can say is that if we're able to personalize using a value-oriented value framework that affects two factors, conversion rate, but also conversion value, and we can measure that in down-funnel KPIs, influence revenue, uh, then we should get significantly more return on our personalization investment. And that's bending the curve, because you're able to affect two factors, the conversion value, as well as the conversion rate, which typical optimization does. So what does this mean? Well, some examples here uh, could be, you know, increasing the engagement leads from target accounts. So the more target accounts you get into your uh, funnel, the more conversion value you're able to deliver. Even if you can keep the conversion rate the same, say your conversion rate is 5% on your forms, but you're increasing the, ra the ratio of the, num of, the, of the target accounts that enter your pipeline to, to the non-target accounts, um, you're, you're able to increase value and get return on that, even though the conversion rate's the same. You can also look at other opportunities along the customer journey uh, to deliver uh, engagement value, such as influencing expansions and renewals from existing customers. And obviously, if you continue to uh, send those higher intent, high value customers to sales, but nurture the high potential lower intent visitors uh, through your website and through your digital marketing channels, you're able to ultimately increase marketing influence, revenue, and conversion value. So how do we get there? How do we bend this curve? Well, I'm going to walk through four uh, major steps of the playbook. The first one is optimizing for the right outcomes. The second piece of this is targeting more valuable audiences and segments. Third, solving the data activation problem. And finally, achieving long-term value and scale through automation. So let's start with the first piece, optimizing for the right outcomes. You know, and we like to say B2B is not equivalent to lead gen. So what I mean by that is, you know, traditionally, uh, website optimization has been focused on a single factor, uh, conversion rate measured at the top of the funnel. Um, now, what this practically means for B2B is, is leads. Uh, but in reality, there are uh, opportunities throughout the funnel, and generating leads is often the least valuable outcome. Uh, for your website personalization. You could be affecting qualified leads, opportunities, expansions, renewal, multiple conversion objectives across that customer journey. So our recommendation then is to uh, optimize for a metric that's as far down, as far down funnel as possible. Ideally rev revenue, but we recognize that there's some challenges uh, with doing that in an enterprise B2B scenario. Uh, because sales, you know, ha obviously has some impact on uh, on revenue, uh, but also because those those timelines to to measure revenue could be too long, uh, and you have to pick some proximal metric. Now, traditional website goal tracking uh, looks something like this, where you have you know a single percentage conversion rate, whether it's in Google Analytics or an A/B test uh, measured, and and this this method of conversion rate uh, measurement and optimization works well when the the time between completion and entrance in the experiment is short. It, it works when the important conversion event happens on site. Both of these examples measure some on site event. And it, it works when the conversion itself is a, is a binary event and you're not factoring in some value into it. Now, obviously, these, these assumptions don't really hold very well uh, when we're talking about a B2B funnel. The first point is that um, when you have a, a significant time lag between the entrance into an experience or an experiment and goal completion, uh, a single conversion rate measure, measured as a percentage starts to fall apart. And to understand this, consider uh, an example where you have, you're have you measuring a visitor to uh, SAL, sales accepted lead conversion rate, uh, over a 12-week period. So it's an experiment that you're running. And that visitor, visitor to SAL conversion rate takes, on average, eight weeks uh, to convert. So within your 12-week population, you're going to have visitor that, visitors that entered the experience or experiment uh, in, in week one and have had 11 weeks to convert, all the way up to visitors that just entered the experiment in the last week and have had less than one week of opportunity to convert. So the visitors that, that, more, that entered the experiment very recently uh, have had significantly less opportunity to convert. Many, m most of them will likely not have converted, and that's going to significantly distort your single percent, percentage conversion rate number. So if you are going to measure conversion rates this way and you do have a long uh, time to conversion, uh, you're much better off running cohorts uh, and looking at the improvement in conversion rates that way. Now, better than this, 
though, is the idea of closed loop attribution. A single conversion rate is not going to be able to give you the magnitude of those conversions. And obviously in B2B, uh, some conversions are much more valuable than others. Closed loop attribution, if you're not familiar with it, uh, basically allocates revenue to upstream marketing and sales campaigns. Um, so it allows you to assess the impact of campaigns to those down funnel outcomes. Now we're talking about personalization here, but attribution can also uh, assess the impact of things like your ad campaigns and uh, outbound campaigns and other things like that. So there are ways to um, I, to be able to uh, tie your personalization to your attribution model uh, with the simple methods. Uh, something that we've done often is pass our campaign data through to Salesforce and, and do some custom reporting. Uh, custom integrations where you can integrate your uh, experiences and campaigns to your BI tool uh, or an off-the-shelf solution uh, like the screenshot here from Visible. Um, that lets you sort of measure and integrates with the rest of your marketing stack to give you a, a more robust attribution picture. So once you have your revenue aligned outcomes and you're, you're looking at the right KPIs, the next step here is targeting more valuable audiences. And remember that unlike B2C, we're not looking at segment, segmentation based on traffic. We want to start segmenting based on value. So how do we do that? How do we identify those high value segments uh, and audiences? Well, you want to look at a combination of factors. Certainly high fit accounts and individuals. Your target account list is a great starting point here. Uh, you can also factor in the customer stage and, and level of engagement uh, and where, they, where the customer is in that journey. Um, and obviously you also want to consider desired outcomes. What are you trying to improve? So some examples here, if you're trying to affect top of the funnel engagement, uh, you might start by segmenting your target accounts. Uh, and looking at account engagement. Uh, if you want to drive more qualified uh, lead nurture and increase your conversion rate on MQLs or SQLs, uh, you might segment your known leads or, or key personas or job titles. If you're trying to drive expansions or renewals, uh, your logical starting point for segmentation might be your customer list and, and the known accounts that you have. If you are trying to uh, steal, steal customers away from competitors, or you're trying to illustrate the technologies that you complement, uh, you might segment by your accounts by technology stack and do personalization for them. And finally, if you're a B2B SaaS company and you're trying to reduce uh, your churn numbers, improve retention, uh, your segmentation might be you know, customers that are, are new and are in the onboarding or have entered a free trial. Now, this kind of segmentation requires that we connect visitors on the website to the relevant context about them so we can create these segments. So starting with some simple examples, target accounts, is, uh, if you're doing account-based marketing, is a logical starting point. Uh, reverse IP providers uh, can take an individual's IP address uh, and translate that into firmographic data, including a company and domain. Uh, so we're getting individual level IP, but we're returning account level data that you can use for segmentation. If you're trying to um, if you're trying to personalize to existing customers or personalize based on other first-party data, such as your technology stack, um, you can use that domain that's returned uh, from the reverse IP providers and use it to unlock a uh, account record in your, in your uh, CRM platform and get back first-party uh, account data that you can use for segmentation. And of course, you can also do this on an individual level as well. If you have marketing automation, marketing automation platforms put a cookie on, on the browser uh, of the lead. Uh, if, if it is a known lead in marketing automation, you can use that cookie to look up lead data uh, and segment that way, along with behavioral activity on the website. So all of this suggests then that uh, there's a lot of data in the enterprise that we can use for personalization, whether that's third-party data from reverse IP or predictive intent providers, uh, first-party data that you've collected in your CRM or marketing automation platform, obviously the behavioral activity, as well as internal data sources. All of this data can be used and activated and connected to that website visitor at both an individual and account level to drive more effective segmentation. Ultimately, that leads, to the, that leads us down the path of the unified customer profile, taking multiple data sources uh, across the enterprise, uh, unifying them into consistent views of accounts and individuals. So this could be first party, third party, website behavioral data, and really it provides us with account and individual 
uh, profiles as well as relationships uh, along with the identity resolution between platforms. So you can translate from you know the CRM record to the marketing automation platform record to the third party uh, provider and can manage that identity resolution within the unified customer profile. We can associate these unified customer profiles and start getting a much better understanding of conversion rates and ultimately the customer journey. When we integrate our unified customer profiles to our personalization platforms and other channels, it provides us much more effective capabilities to deliver campaigns to our most important customers. And finally, you know, having the unified customer profile also allows for more sophisticated segmentation down the road. Uh, a common example of this might be, you know, your target accounts that have at least one qualified lead. That's an example of a very valuable segment that you might target. So some examples of the sort of uh, attributes and characteristics that we look at at an account or individual level. On the account level, it's you know, all the firmographic information, company, industry, number of employees, uh, as well as first party data. Are they existing customer? Um, are there current opportunities open? On an individual level, uh, we look at things like lead score, or job title, uh, predictive score, as well as behavior on the website uh, as common attributes that we create audiences from. So with our uh, with our with the right outcomes in place, with the uh, more valuable segments, how do we actually scale a personalization program and deliver more value with less effort? Well, at Funnel Envy, we think of personalization as a progression. As we've talked about, having the uh, having the right KPIs and aligning on the right outcomes is really important. Data activation and unification is a key enabler, uh, along with the unified customer profile, that allows for segmentation and identifying those more valuable customers and opportunities. True personalization, in our opinion, is actually done at a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, it can work in concert with those segments, but really we're trying to maximize on an individual basis the likelihood of those outcomes. So to really understand what that means in practice, let's go back to our Huli example. Now, if we uh, remember this, Huli ran some uh, A-B testing, A-B tests of different experiences on their site, got some mixed results and didn't know where to go from there. So what we want to be able to do with personalization is take any one of these experiences and show them to the right individual at the right time to maximize their outcome. To understand how we might approach this problem, it helps to think uh, back to Nina, our, our role model uh, account executive at Huli. And she's taking in a variety of contexts and historical data to be able to identify the right next step and the right experience for each customer. And it turns out we can model that digitally in what we call predictive decisioning. So first, we start with a set of rules, uh, accounts that qualify for an enterprise. And every business has these, some hard constraints on uh, who, they, who they sell to or who fits within a particular industry. Uh, and these are the rules for our audience. Now within, within these rules, uh, there's a variety of different types of customers as we've seen. Um, different uh, job titles, different functions, different levels of, uh, of intent and engagement. And with our unified customer profile, we can model these as a set of account attributes, individual attributes, and other you know, behavioral engagement that we've seen from that unified customer profile. Well, we know about our uh, outcomes and, and the revenue aligned outcomes that we're trying to drive. And what we've put in place uh, in front of the outcome is a series of engagements. Now, in this case, we have defined three of them, uh, content nurture, free trial, or talk to sales. These are the things that visitors can do, which ultimately have some likelihood to, uh, to achieve that, that revenue outcome. In front of those engagements, we've got our, our experiments or, or our variations, experiences that we're delivering uh, in front of the customer. These are the different pages. That the, uh, that the website marketing team has come up with at Huli that try to turn into those different engagements. So if we factor all that in, what we're fundamentally trying to answer is which of those experiments and which of those uh, experiences is the right one for any particular visitor uh, and any particular uh, unified customer profile. So if we can factor in and bring to bear historical data whether that's historical profiles that have gone through uh, this, this uh, series of experiments and engagements, uh, previous conversion data, uh, the engagements themselves, and, and which ones have led to uh, the revenue outcome, and, and finally, the, the, out, the outcome data itself. We can feed in historical data as well, to, as well as build a continuous feedback loop into our predictive decisioning engine. Well, then we can start doing some interesting things. 
turns out that we can calculate in real time the weighted probability, the propensity, that any of those engagements turn into uh, our revenue outcome. Uh, and that propensity is a likelihood for that specific unified customer profile, for that individual, based on historical data, that any one of those engagements, uh, whether it's talk to sales, if they fill out the talk to sales form, is going to turn into the outcome, as well as the magnitude of that outcome. So it's the probability times the magnitude. We can also determine through experimentation the conversion rate of any one of those experiments to those engagements. And again, that can be informed uh, based on the unified customer profile and the historical data. So we can, we can get to an answer and get to an ideal variation uh, for any particular individual much faster than randomized A-B testing. And so with that, the predictive decisioning engine can actually determine in real time the highest likelihood variation to maximize the outcome by multiplying the campaign conversion rate times that weighted probability and actually decide in real time which experience is most likely to generate outcome for any particular individual. That's real time individual personalization. So what are the features of our predictive decisioning model? Well, as we've talked about, it's realistic. Uh, marketers have loved to, to create deterministic customer journey maps where a uh, customer you know, starts by downloading a white paper, then attending an event, then speaking to sales, and then converting. In reality, it's very unlikely for customers to all go through that same model. So here we're assuming a probabilistic customer journey that assigns a weighted probability to all of those steps in the customer journey. Our predictive decisioning model is, is, is more informed. So uh, because we're able to uh, factor in historical data and have a unified customer profile, uh, we're able to identify the optimal variation for any engagement much faster than randomized A-B testing. We're able to build what's called an informed prior into our experimentation. This is obviously much easier than manual uh, rules-based personalization. So setting up audiences, managing the campaigns, that's all work that's associated with rules-based personalization. With the predictive decisioning model, the, uh, the engine, the algorithm is making those decisions for you and learning as it goes along. So it eliminates a lot of that manual effort and data analysis. The model is inherently adaptive. Uh, using machine learning, we can bring in new data and constantly optimize uh, and, and with that new data uh, and adapt to changing circumstances. And circumstances change all the time. Uh, behavior on your site changes all the time, um, but there are also events that you can't control, such as a competitor uh, announcing a new product. Um, the, the predictive decisioning model can bring in data in real time and learn and, and, and uh, change the rules as, as circumstances dictate. Obviously, in predictive decisioning, unlike you know, rules-based uh, experimentation or personalization, works on an individual one-to-one -one basis. And for any individual, uh, we're able to factor in uh, all of their account, individual, and behavioral attributes to determine that optimal experience on a one-to-one -one basis. So what is the net result of all of this? Well, for marketers, it allows them to focus on campaign creation, and they're happier. They don't have to do you know, a lot of the data lifting associated with, with traditional personalization. For the CMO, uh, they're happy because they've influenced you know, what, what we consider to be the primary KPI of personalization, increasing marketing influence revenue. Sales team is happier because they're getting uh, and able to focus more time on higher quality prospects and get out of that uh, more revenue and, and deal velocity. And the lower quality prospects stay in the marketing layer and get nurtured until they're ready. Finally, the CEO is happy. Anytime that uh, your marketing and digital marketing is doing more of the work and the sales team is more focused on the high value uh, prospects and leads, uh, you re we have the net effect of reducing our customer acquisition cost. So in summary, um, if we think about value-based personalization for B2B and how to get more value and bend the curve uh, from our investment, uh, leave, I'll leave you with a few takeaways. One, you know, more options does not lead uh, to more value. It's not about just uh, pushing out content and redesigns. Uh, think about the individual customer, where they are, and focus on increasing their signal uh, and, and relevance and reducing noise. As part of your personalization strategy, certainly 
focus on conversion, uh, conversion and engagement value. One of the top reasons that we see personalization programs failing in a B2B environment is a lack of alignment on the right outcomes. So, so thinking about and aligning on revenue-based outcomes is important, as well as bringing to bear segmentation strategies that can lead to those outcomes. As we said, uh, activating and unifying your uh, enterprise data uh, and, and getting all that data out of the silos into a unified customer profile uh, for segmentation and ultimately predictive decisioning uh, is an important enabler to your personalization strategy. And finally, in our opinion, uh, long-term value at scale uh, through in, in personalization is going to be achieved like it typically is and like it often is uh, through automation. And that's predictive decisioning, uh, which uses uh, predictive and machine learning capabilities to identify the optimal experience for an individual visitor in real time. Thank you very much for listening.